Welcome back to another video, everybody. My name is Ski Mask Bro, and today we are going to be going over the DCF or the discounted cash flow analysis, which is one of the most commonly asked questions in an investment banking technical interview. So the question is gonna be, walk me through a DCF. And this video is gonna be two parts. The first part, I am going to tell you guys word for word how to walk someone through a DCF in an interview so you can nail that question every single time. And the second thing is I'm gonna break down the answer that I gave in the first part. So my phone is on 6% right now. We're about to die, we're about to go lights out. So I'm just gonna nail this whole video through one single take, no cuts. Part one, this is how you walk someone through a DCF word for word. <clears throat> yeah, so a DCF on a high level is an intrinsic valuation methodology that is used to value a company based on the present value of its future free cash flows. And generally, when you're building a DCF, there are four major steps. The first step is that you want to forecast out the financials of your business by making various assumptions around your revenue, expenses, and working capital items so that ultimately you can get to your unlevered free cash flow for the next five to seven year period. And after you do that, the second step is that you're gonna sum up your unlevered free cash flows together and discount them back to the present using a discount rate, which is usually your WAC or your weighted average cost of capital. And that is gonna get you the present value of your unlevered free cash flows. And once you get that, you're gonna set that to the side. And the third step is that you're gonna calculate your terminal value through two methods. The first one is gonna be the perpetuity method, or you could use the exit multiple method. And once you get your terminal value, you're also gonna discount that back to the present um, using the discount rate. And then after you do that, the last step is that you're gonna sum up the present value of your unlevered free cash flows with the present value of your terminal value, and that's gonna give you the total enterprise value of your business, which is the value that is available to all shareholders across your capital structure. And then you can subtract your net debt, add back your cash to get your equity value, divide by the total or the fully diluted shares outstanding, and then you get your target share price. That is all you need in an interview to nail the questions. And I understand that there is a good amount of buzzwords used, but for this walkthrough, generally what you guys wanna do is you guys need to also take into account timing considerations here, right? You don't want your answer to be too long, but you also want to probably a minute to a minute 30 to help your sort of interviewer know that you sort of understand the flow of DCF. And then it's actually advantageous to you guys because what that does is that it sort of gives your interviewer a Chinese menu of things to pick from that they could ask about, which one, sucks up time for the interview, and two, you already know what's gonna come next, right? From that answer you gave, they could either ask you, hey, what is a discount rate? What is a weighted average cost of cost capital? Can you give me sort of the formula to answer that? Or like, can you walk me from revenue to unlevered free cash flow? What is intrinsic versus relative valuation methodologies? And each one of these answers following your, each one of these questions sort of following your DCF answers, you theoretically already prepared for, which ultimately means that one, it takes away time from your interview because they ask you questions that you already know. And two, it gives you additional shots on goal to answer questions that you are very prepared for. So this method is sort of, in my opinion, pretty highly effective during technical investment banking interviews. So with that said, we're gonna go to part two of this video gonna be a pretty short video. Um, we are gonna break down each of these steps that I just mentioned in part one. So through DCF, there are four major things that you guys need to know. The first one is intrinsic versus relative valuation. The second one is unlevered free cash flow. The third one is your discount rate or your WAC. And the fourth one is your terminal value. So with the first one regarding intrinsic versus relative valuation methodologies, intrinsic values your company based on the inherent value of the business. So it solely looks at the business on a standalone basis outside of external market conditions, and it judges your business's ability to generate sustainable cash flows into the indefinite future. All right, for example, if I own a lemonade stand, right, like you're not gonna sort of look at comparable lemonade stands to see how much you would buy my stand for, but rather you're gonna see sort of the product that I'm selling, whether it's the quality of the products, my operational efficiency, 
how many stands that I have, how many units I'm selling per day, and you're gonna calculate its ability to generate sustainable cash flow over a period of time, and then you're gonna value it based on that, which is essentially the first half of the DCF walkthrough, versus a relative valuation methodology where you're gonna sort of look at, I guess, comps or present transactions, or in this case, every sort of lemonade stand within a 10 block radius from my stand, and you're gonna say, okay, those other seven stands around you are selling at $500. So therefore, I think that your lemonade stand is also gonna be worth somewhere around that $500 range, right? It could be worth a premium, right? If you have, let's say, like a secret recipe, right? Let's say I'm throwing zins in the lemonade, right? To make it highly addictive. So my customer base is very recurring and durable. Or, right, you could be trading at a discount because your lemonade recipe is just Kool-Aid from Kool-Aid mix from Costco, right? There's no long-term sustainable differentiation, right? Therefore, every lemonade stand trades at 500. I'm gonna, let's say, pay you $300, right? And this is the assumption that every lemonade stand sort of has the same level of top line revenue and similar levels of profitability. So that is sort of intrinsic versus extrin, like in, intrinsic versus relative valuation methodologies, right? Intrinsic values your business on a standalone basis. Relative is your present transactions and your trading comps, which values your company based on where other similar companies are trading from a multiples perspective. Second concept is your unlevered free cash flow. In order to understand this concept, you guys need to understand that cash flow is the excess value that is created from your company on the bottom line that is accessible through three things, right? You could do either reinvest cash back into your business, right? To fuel additional initiatives like product development, R&D, et cetera, to sort of continue the growth trajectory. Or it's access cash that's available for your investors, both from an equity investor and a debt holders or a lender's perspective, right? And that is where unlevered free cash flows come in. That is sort of the cash flow that is available to all of the investors within your capital structure. And in order to get to unlevered free cash flow, you start from your revenue, you would take out your COGS, which is the direct costs associated with generating that revenue, you would get to your gross profit. From your gross profit, you're gonna subtract out your operating expenses, which is typically your s and sales and marketing, R&D, research development, or GNA, general and administrative expenses. And then you're gonna arrive at your EBIT, right? Which is your operating income. And from there, right, what you're gonna do is that you're gonna subtract out your tax expenses because that's a cash expense, right? From that EBIT line, you're gonna take out every sort of other P&L expenses not directly related to operations or sort of cash flow items, you're gonna take out all of the cash flow sort of items that have like a, all of the items that have like a material impact on cash flow. So you're gonna take out your tax expense and you're gonna arrive to your NOPAT, which is your net operating profit after taxes. And then from there, you're gonna take out your CapEx, even though that's not in your P&L, that is sort of the cash that's flowing out on your cash flow statement in order to acquire long-term fixed assets like your pp and &E. You're gonna add back DNA because that's a non-cash expense. And then you're gonna subtract out any increase in networking capital because that is ultimately a use of cash, right? And the best way to think about working capital, right? It's that it's the daily amount of cash levels that's required to support the day-to-day -day operations of your business, all right? So let's say, what, let's say today, right? Like I have a bag of chips, right? Which is an asset. And I bought that bag of chips using a credit card, right? So I paid $1 for the chip, but I use $1 of my credit, right? So I have $1 in assets and I have $1 in liabilities. So that nets out, my networking capital is zero. But let's say tomorrow I buy another bag of chips for a dollar, but instead of using my credit card, I actually use my cash, right? So my networking capital tomorrow is ultimately one versus today, which is zero. So the change in networking capital goes up by one. So it's a use of cash, right? Because instead of using a liability to fund my asset, I use cash to fund it. So ultimately it's a use of cash, so it's a cash outflow. That's why you subtract any increase in networking capital or add back any decrease. And then from there you get to your unlevered free cash flow. And then the last piece of this, no, sorry, the third piece of this is your discount rate, right? Or your WAC, your weighted average cost of capital. And the best way to understand this is your, your WAC is the blended cost of all sources of financing within your company's capital structure, 
We're not gonna get into formulas on this video, but what you guys need to understand is that if you flip that on its head, essentially the reason why capital costs money is because in order for you to get money from investors, they're taking on a risk, right? So your WAC or your discount rate, if you flip it on its head, what it means is that it means it is the minimum amount that your investors are expected to be paid back or it is the minimum amount that, you expect, that your investors want to be compensated for taking on the risk of investing in your business, right? For example, the cost of debt, right, on a very simplified level is forget about the WAC formula for a second, is ultimately your interest rate, right? A lender takes a risk that you might go bankrupt to lend you money, and let's say they charge an 8% interest rate. So on a minimum level, they're expecting to get that 8% back on a year to year basis to compensate them for taking the risk of lending you money. Equity investors is the same thing, but usually the cost of equity is a little bit higher, not just because of the interest tax shield on the debt, but also because the risk that an equity holder takes to invest in a company is way higher than the risk of a lender takes because of how junior they are on ultimately the cap stack, right? For example, if a company goes bankrupt, lenders have first claiming assets. And then if you're just a common equity holder, you have last, so you're claiming your residual value. And in the case of a bankruptcy, usually you don't, there's no residual value left over, so you're wiped out, right? So it's like at the end of the day, like your bottom line risk as an equity holder is higher, therefore your expectation or the cost of equity is higher because you're expecting as an equity holder to get more return on a year over year basis because you're taking more risk. And the last, um, point is your terminal value, right? Your terminal value is essentially the value of your business outside of your forecasted period of your unlevered free cash flows, right? So let's say you do a DCF, you forecast out your unlevered free cash flows for the next seven years, right? Sure, right? Like if you add that together, you discount that back, that's the present value of your neck of your unlevered free cash flows. But there's also years eight to infinity, right? Where your company could potentially exist and then it is impossible to sort of accurately forecast that out. So what the terminal value does is that it prescribes a value on the remainder of that unforecasted period. And it sort of values that remainder um, and factors it into your overall enterprise value, right? So usually your terminal value could make up, let's say 75% to 80% of the total TEV, right? Because your first five to seven years of unlevered free cash flow, right? That present value, that's sort of the value that is, has high visibility, you see it coming in, but then there's also the remaining value of the business that's captured through the terminal value. And that's why that's the last step. And then again, you discount all those things back using your WAC, which is your cost of capital, which is the amount that your investors who are investing both from an equity and debt perspective are expecting to get paid back. And yeah. Thank you guys for watching. Um, this is just a conceptual and theoretical walkthrough. I'm gonna be doing a DCF from scratch video soon, um, whenever I have the time, but tonight is sort of Labor Day. Uh, so I have a little bit of time to put these things together, do some research, and thank you guys so much for watching. And if you guys have any feedback on this raw take, please put it below and please, let me know what other videos you guys want to see. Like, I'm not gonna be uploading as frequently if things get busy because my job is my priority. But, you know, like, if you guys have anything you guys wanna see, just post it below. I'm constantly reading the comments. So I might sort of like register some things here and there and then they keep the juices flowing for my next video. But until then, happy Labor Day, everybody. Um, best of luck on the incoming fall and the winter until the holidays. See you guys then. Bye.